And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Legitanime Games creators of the up of the upcoming introductory zine for Metanthropes, the one and only, well, John Legitanime. How you doing today, man? Hello, Monk. Thanks for having me in the monastery. And thank you for coming in. Oh, and, and as I mentioned before we went live, braving time zone hell to, vi to visit my temple. It's it's pretty it's pretty nice in here with it's it's noon. I think you're in the bitter end of the time zone in this occasion. So it's all good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so, something like that something like that. So it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings in a sense. So walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Gladly. Um, I still remember rushing down the stairs to play Advanced Dungeons and Dragons as a teenager with my older brother's uh, friends, who I was uh, lucky enough to be invited. They were like, uh, have you read L uh, Lord of the Rings, a book? And I was like, uh, yeah, okay, then you qualify, you can play D&D with us, AD&D. And uh, I was completely captivated with the with the non-scripted, interactive, dice rolling, character creation, imagination thing of playing TTRPGs. And we played a few sessions, but it wasn't until in a, another gaming convention I found the, an introductory uh, handbook for Vampire the Masquerade, who, which was translated to my language, which is Greek. And uh, back then as a teenager, I wasn't very keen on English. and. Uh, that really hit the spot for me and my friends, and we started playing Bumper the Masquerade like crazy. That made us. That made it stick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I could, I can definitely see. I can definitely see that. Um, but with now, would you say? Would I know you meant you mentioned? Um, Vampire, would you say that you had jumped around between a bunch of different systems over the years? Well, World of Darkness in general was my de facto for game for RPGs. Uh, but uh, sure, uh, I've, I've, I've stumbled across many systems, uh, specifically, mainly besides uh, Dungeons Dragons 3.5, that was a version that we played the most, like epic levels and stuff like that. Uh, and most games of uh, of um, uh, World of Darkness, primarily Vampire Masquerade and Vampire Dark Ages. We also, I also played quite a lot of uh, the Warhammer games, both fantasy and uh, 40k, like um, Rogue Trader and some other homebrew stuff that we played throughout the whole Horus Heresy, and uh, many many other wonderful adventures, and. Um, a lot of one shots from uh, uh, here and there and uh, post pandemic it was actually when i started playing with people online uh, up to then i've never played with total strangers you know from other countries online and uh, since then i've played like a lot of games like uh, alien rpg those dark places and um, yeah i started to open up my horizons even more when it comes to both the the variety of games and of players, which I find most interesting. Mm -hmm. I can I can see that. Now, with Metanthropes, was was this a concept that you had been kicking around for a while? How, what was the origin story for the idea? Yeah, you can say that it has been quite a while. Uh, before I actually gave it a name and uh, the identity, 
it was one of the first games that I wanted to design as a when I began my journey as a game designer like 10 years ago. So I had this uh, vision of a game which is, was going to use the D100 system and uh, have uh, 100 superpowers, I called them back then. Now we call them meta powers. And uh, I've, st I've played around with it a little bit. And the original idea was to be something like a computer role playing game besides using like the foundations of an RPG system, which is the D100 system. And uh, then I began my journey. I created some demos here and there. Then I move over to, to tabletop, but uh, like board games, not RPG games. And it wasn't until like five years ago when I decided that the thing that would motivate me the most and uh, fill my, my, my life with inspiration every day and uh, happiness it is uh, working on this particular game which will be a ttrpg game and thus five years ago began the official design for uh, a game design for metanthropes and uh, and then it evolved a bit again after the pandemic when we couldn't play with my uh, local trusted group of players and um, we had to improvise and started to uh, scouting the landscape of virtual tabletops and see how we're going to do this with Discord or Skype and stuff like that. And uh, much like many other players around the world, I guess, we evolved and we adapted the new ways to play and we found uh, some, some things that are not just compensating, but actually making it even, even nicer playing online. Uh, Primarily meeting and playing with other people which you would never had the opportunity to play from your local gaming shop and and, and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can get that. And and one of the things you've noted right out of the gate is integration with um, Foundry. Yeah. Well, uh, at, at the beginning there was another virtual tabletop that we chose. Uh, which is now officially dead. Uh, rest in peace, Astral Tabletop, a virtual tabletop. Uh, it didn't make it, didn't survive over the years. And uh, when we began developing in on that game, uh, Foundry didn't even exist back then. It, it began, you know, at, at least it wasn't public. It became public a little after when we were already, already kind of committed on the other thing. But we knew from the start that Astral didn't fully satisfy all the things, all our requirements for our home as a VTT. Uh, so by the time that uh, Astral announced that they were no longer provide the services after a certain amount of time, we began eyeing uh, Foundry VTT because um, there are many VTTs out there, right? Especially now these days. And um, I think that Foundry is the only one which can truly take a homebrew system and um, and embrace all the automations and customizations that you want to include, which, which is fully customizable if you know code. And uh, I don't know code, but thankfully my brother stepped up and uh, took that role and started slowly but steadily less than a year ago. It is actually in two days from now, from this recording, that we're going to celebrate one year of starting the development. So in less than one year, we managed to encapsulate like the vast majority of the game and the system and uh, most of the content. Uh, actually, not, not most of the content because the content is vast, but uh, at least the introductory content for sure for, uh, for Foundry VTT. And we are truly amazed of what that platform can do when it comes to automizations, customizations, integrations, and uh, and generally uh, making all compensating for all the things that you're missing when you're not up close with one another. I've I've heard a lot of people say that how can you play VTT? Don't you miss the sound of dice rolling and looking at your dice rolling? Well, with Foundry, you can actually hear both the sound and see visually 3D dice bouncing around, for example. So it uh, compensates, but also enriches mm -hmm. 
the experience in ways that uh, we didn't know that were even possible. Yeah, and I, I often hear I often hear that kind of thing when people um, attempt to dismiss virtual tabletop. But my attitude has been has been it whether it whether it's in front of a screen or or at a table, they're still playing. Um, everything else everything else is ju is just um, noise. Yeah, I remember asking my players the very first times that we played online in general, how was it? Did you, was it like role play for you? And they were like, yeah, after like the first 10 minutes, it was the same. You know, it, we didn't feel like any different, even though that we weren't around the table in a physical uh, essence, uh, sense rather. Uh, but um, th there are pros and cons with playing both physical and digital. And, um, of course, you cannot really replace, you know, uh, the number one thing that is missing from from the, the lack of technology, rather, it is being able to talk one upon another, like two people at the same time. If this happens in a digital virtual like uh, environment, maybe none of them will be heard eventually and there will be echo and stuff like that. Um, but on the other end, let's say that you're um, you're you're playing a game that has like um, uh, you want to activate something and you need to check the books and then uh, wait I need to open the light because we're playing with candles and I cannot find the the paper to write down the stuff and the and the, the rubber to remove you know hit points and stuff like that there is none of this like a lag from the game when you're playing actual virtual tabletop because you just click a button. Everything is automated. You exactly get all the levels of success that you require, the automations, the automatic targeting, and all those things are things that are not really available when you're playing the old school, old fashioned way of physical. So there are pros and cons. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, are you playing online a lot? Um, yes. A lot of it, do, a lot of it, due to locations with with my players, but also because there's there's cer there's certain angles that I want that I want to experiment with, um, and now with now with that in mind, let's let's shift into um, meta metanthropes. So. You have you have the premise of it be of it being centered around ordinary humans who have, who possess these gifts that um, make them make them almost um, post humans. So I think I think one of the key one of the key things to go in with that is do you can throughout the throughout the whole throughout the whole thing you've you've never referred to it as su as superheroes or de or demigods but when you're dealing with this idea of power and its pr and its price and having these extra normal abilities there's a lot of directions that that can go in and even though you're not you're not doing full character creation because this is an introductory kit is ensuring that there isn't a analysis paralysis something that has is that something that you've considered during the development of this? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question, uh, Monk. Um, let's start with uh, the the superhero thing because it's actually one of the frequently asked questions, <laughs> and uh, I purpose purpose purposely purple. Okay, lost in translation. On purpose, mm -hmm. I tried to um, deviate from using that word. Because uh, the game has superpowers, yes, but it's not about superheroes. It's metanthropes. It, uh, the, uh, the origins is a Greek word, which uh, is metanthropos, which translates to beyond human, aka metahuman. So it's about uh, metahumanism, uh, transhumanism, and what comes after the, the human experience in general. So basically, the, the very word of metanthropes has the duality of meta which is like beyond mm -hmm. and anthropes which is like human so humans 
meta, sorry, uh, metanthropes are are gifted with these extraordinary gifts we call meta powers, which are basically superpowers, and uh, in the traditional sense. And uh, but they are also tethered to human passions and human to a human identity. So you're playing both something beyond, but also something grounded and anchored to humans, uh, human passions and errors and and way of thinking in general. So it brings the, it poses a question: What would you do with such incredible power as a human, which now is able to teleport or pass through walls or read minds or open gates to other dimensions? Mm-hmm. And uh, as for the, can you remind me the second part? Sorry, oh, the question de- dealing dealing with analysis paralysis since. A lot of games that utilize some sort of power, some sort of power system in that sense, in that freeform sense, there's the there's the risk of 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 that issue. Um, this is a this is an issue that a lot of that yeah the majority of supers games have to wrestle with in one form or another. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, obviously, th- this doesn't uh, happen with this particular zine. Uh, running now on Kickstarter because there, there are only like 10 options of 10 pre-made characters that have everything set up for them. Uh, but in the core game, and we do offer core digital uh, products with this campaign, so you can have the core game in the, the foundry with this campaign, early access of course. Uh, we do have a hundred different meta powers and each of them has five levels. So you start the game with 500 different options just to start, you know, just to, to break the ice. So uh, I'm pretty certain option paralysis, much like other games that have so many options, it's a, it's a, it's a very thing, it's a very possibility. And metanthropes are not limited to playing just one thing. Like if you want to play the teleporter, doesn't mean that you cannot also play the mind controller. It, it just depends on where you choose to spend your experience and which, fo- which path your character wishes to follow. Um, so, uh, well, to, to be honest, I think if you're an, a person who who has this uh, option paralysis, I would suggest that you just pick the 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 powers that you feel like playing. And forget optimization and uh, going the best route. Just go with the flow for in-game. Like, for example, if your character faces some troubles and they they like to hide, just pick invisibility. That that's, There's no actual paralysis there. But for those that wish to tinker and min-max and find the best optimal route, I think they're going to love the, the options and the and the, the, the different routes that you can get you to even more supplement content, which is combos, which can further <laughs> intensify the fear of paralysis. But again, I think, I think, I personally think that this happens only to people which have, uh, which really want to optimize their character. And if they have all many options, like, oh, how can I, I don't want to make a mistake and lose some experience here and there. So, um, I think it's a, you know both a blessing and a curse having so many options in the game, but this is exactly the game that I wanted to create. I love having so much content, and I and I'm I'm trying to. I hope that my players will like it too. You know. Mm-hmm. So with now with that said, you are doing a D100 system, and. There's multiple ways. There's multiple ways to go. It obviously there's the percentile approach, but there are some games that are doing it as a aim high. Rollmaster is one example of that. Are you are you doing it as a percentile role, a, a la basic role playing, or are you do, or are you doing a aim high? Uh, I'm going for aim low. Uh, my D100 influences, as I said, was uh, primarily uh, Warhammer games. Uh, with the percentiles and Call of Cthulhu a bit. So the lower you roll, the best result you will have. And the higher stats you have, the best chance of succeeding you will have. 
And even though my two D100 influences were Warhammer and Call of Cthulhu are both very dark and uh, grimy and very, the player is meant to feel powerless and uh, facing uh, odds stacked against them. And uh, I, I took this system and I translated it in a way that players will easily get high stats. That's no, it's not uncommon to have, even with starter characters, your stats being above 50%, which is like a good chance to succeed. And easily by activating a meta power to your main stat, you can reach it to 80%. It's not, it's not uncommon, it's actually pretty easy. And even, not necessarily to this introductory scene, which is like starter set, but once you start playing like four to five sessions, you can easily exceed 100%, which is uh, another story what happens then, but it's not, it's part of the game and it's built upon that because I want players to feel this uh, thing that I'm talking about of being of limitless power in a setting of endless possibilities. And with uh, another mechanic that uh, complements this feeling of being a powerful, limitless individual with uh, many wondrous abilities, is the system that uh, the mechanic that I call destiny, which is uh, at the end of each scene, and role playing and uh, gaming actually is at each session is segmented into scenes. You can have one role play scene, then uh, uh, an action scene, and so on. At the end of each scene, you are awarded destiny based on your role play mm -hmm. and uh, the role play options that you have selected. Destiny is a resource which can be spent for re rolls but also it can save you from dying and can be used to activate the really high leveled meta powers. But uh, you get quite a lot because there are, you get them automatically at the end of each scene and based on your role play is segmented into your arc, which is your general um, idea, your daily agenda, your ethics, and, uh, and also your regression, which is what keeps you tethered to human passions and um, and, uh, and ethics and errors, the thing that I was talking about earlier. So both of these things award you with destiny. So you are really motivated to role play as much as you can in this game because you get lots and lots of riddles. It's not a common to have like every session, at least five, maybe to 10 more riddles. So you will feel, hmm, this didn't work. I will gamble it and reroll again. Always you keep the last option. You cannot go back with the riddles. Uh, but you can spend as many as you want. So, uh, in summary, take your high stats with the D100 system and the lots of rerolls should translate and transverse to that feeling of being extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. That's That certainly makes sense. Now, it, I, know you've sta I know you've stated that it's a classless system, but, it, but is it going to be a... Are you still using an attribute skill dynamic, or is it? Because um, you mentioned what you mentioned, um, Warhammer, and the approach that it has is y your attributes are your base percentile and skills just treated as ten, twenty, or thirty points hi points higher. Are you doing something like that with attributes and skills, or do you have a different setup in mind? A classless system would refer that you don't have to pick like a career, like an apothecary who will become a, a cleric, for example, or hammer or something like that. Um, and uh, the, the, the we have, you have the stats, you have nine stats in this game, uh, which are like stats of the body, stats of the mind, stats of the soul, and uh, which are in the form of percentage. And this is what you roll in game. But when it comes to anything else really besides some secondary stuff like perks like knowing stuff knowledge and or being athletic and stuff like that which doesn't really just give you options more more likely in role play and in action scenes uh, the main focus of this game is in the meta powers themselves and uh, although we have classifications of meta powers to like categorize them in, for example, the kinetics. We have pyrokinesis, electrokinesis, and, and or uh, 
cosmonauts which can like teleport or project themselves through other dimensions. Mm -hmm. A metanthrope is uh, even if you select one, uh, you begin with one classification. One meta power has to be your prime meta power, the one that ma made your metanthrope, and this is what you be your your early beginnings, your humble beginnings. But it doesn't really limit you to playing anything you want. For example, in the X Men universe, the, the mutants. Uh, rarely, if ever, they develop anything else other than the thing that they're known of. Let's say Cyclops, for example, has his optic beam, but you won't really see, at least in canon, uh, Cyclops teleporting, you know, or flying or stuff like that. At least in canon, because, the, you know, these comics are vast. Mm -hmm. So, metanthropes are not limited, limited in this way, and you can begin with the flying and then take... Uh, something like uh, memory manipulation, and then take uh, something like breaking the fourth wall and do whatever really you want. Uh, oh, oh, there's some some like uh, uh, differences when it comes to spending your XP. Mm -hmm. So this is where the optimization comes in for those that really want to optimize and min-max their character again. But uh, other than that, you can take, you can follow whatever path you like. And with that, now with that in mind, I'd like to sh I'd like to shift into the into the meta power setup. Now, obviously, going into all of the meta powers that you have planned would be would be a case where we'd be here all damn day. So, <laughs> so instead, I'd like to go I'd like to go over the uh, the um, archetypes that are brought up on the on the Kickstarter itself. And just get just get a feel for what's for what the general style that they'd lean towards is, as well as what characters in fiction would be analogous to them. Sound good? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, uh, I didn't have any any characters in fiction for each of them. I think I can do that thought exercise right now. Mm -hmm. But this uh, temporary made ex uh, this temporary made characters. Besides having one unique meta power each, the, each of them has all the options of the game are unique. So let's say that the arc and regression that I explained earlier, we have ten of each. Mm -hmm. So for these ten meta powers, each of them has a unique arc, a unique meta power, unique regression, and a unique perk. And uh, these are basically the, the things that starting character has. So let's start with the an alphabetical order, the Aegis. Yep. Which is uh, okay. The healer of the game, I guess, is the archetype of a protecting, a nurturing spirit that wants to heal others. And uh, moving on, it's going to be like a brief explanation for each. Uh, moving on to the animator, which is uh, the infamous duplicating person, which is like a, an illusionist that has uh, the regression of an alter ego, which means that uh, then they activating the meta powers, they need to do it under a persona. And hide behind. Mm -hmm. Then we go to an arbiter, which was an aloof academic who has made a dark pact with an entity, a very powerful entity that bends destiny to their will. And uh, as a luck bender now, they can they basically can influence the resource of destiny that I talked about, which is are basically their rerolls. They gain more rerolls and they can influence the rerolls of others, force others to reroll, and so on. Then we go to an investigative character with the clairvoyant, which is a, a journalist with sixth sense. So they can see things that the others cannot. Uh, they can see invisible cards, they can see spirits, they can know the psychosynthesis of those around them. But they're also facing the regression is disbelief, which is one very super interesting regression to play because they don't really believe that they're meta power. They don't really believe that they're a metanthrope. They really believe that they're super intuitive, but not really a metanthrope. So you're playing the disbelief with this card, which is always fun and interesting. Uh, then we have the controller, which is the scientist of the crew, who, who through scientific experimentation, they can now control gravity. So... Uh, it is a very, um, like an architect type of personality, a scientist who, which, uh, which, is, uh, which can control gravitational waves. Now that we're in the half point uh, mark, 
Um, do you have any questions for them before I go on mm -hmm. for the first five? Um, I was I was gonna say that the when you describe when you mentioned the animator making duplicates of themselves, um, the first thing that came to mind from X Men is the Multiple Man. Yeah. Uh, sure. I, I was thinking more of a duplicate from Invincible because I was watching Invincible uh, these days, the second season. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, all, you know what? All these meta powers, at one point or another, have a, a fictional character, whether that would be in comics or in uh, TV series or in books. And uh, it is it is fine to describe them as such, you know. Uh, I'm not against anything, but you know, not two telepaths, for example, are the same. Um, so you cannot really, or two teleporters, so you cannot really compare uh, Dr. Xavier with Dr. Manhattan or, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, if someone is uh, asking me, is like the tele is like the multiple man uh, from uh, X-Men, I would most def definitely say yes. That's exactly how you can uh, take advantage of this meta power. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to be the mood, but I think, for example, this I think it is a it's a bank robber, the multiple uh, man. I'm not right now entirely sure of their background in, uh, in X Men, but let's say you want to play this meta power, but be like an academic and uh, <laughs> reading ten books at the same time. You can do that. You don't have to be just follow the the classical trope uh, of uh, the character that this superhuman ability is most known for. But I, so let's yeah, yeah. Let's continue on. I believe the next one you had was Cosmonaut. Yeah, let's uh, this so this one for example um, is uh, has the power of dark energy projection. This game is closer to science fiction and trying to be as pseudo scientific as possible. And uh, when I say dark dark energy, I don't mean like any necrotic evil energy. I'm referring to the scientific term of dark energy, which is this uh, the reason that the universe is expanding and accelerating its expansion. So this uh, explorer has uh, access to abilities that over distance and acceleration, but uh, the regression is that they have uh, they were they, they had the their cosmic connection, where they develop the powers, was very traumatic for them. So they 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 are very suppressant. They feel suppressive when they use their meta powers. So you have to play this interesting dynamic of having something that is very useful when it comes to movement, but feeling reluctant reluctant to use it. Mm -hmm. But if those things are kind of complicated for you, or you want to play something straightforward, we do have a very straightforward option. It is the Hammer archetype, the Hammer uh, protagonist, which is basically meta strength, aka super strength, which you are basically a, a physical <laughs> marvel, and uh, your uh, roleplay is very predatorial and uh, competitive, and um, you are like a pro athlete with who can jump extremely high and punch really hard. So if you want just to punch stuff in your <laughs> introductory session, uh, definitely pick this one. It's super simple and fun. And if you feel also like damaging stuff, but not in a punching way, we also have the kineticist, uh, and specifically the electrokineticist with electrokinesis, which is uh, which was a wandering soul in a, of artistic nature, who after an accident in rate nature probably struck by lightning but it's up to the player to elaborate the details they now control electricity and uh, and uh, they can hurl lightning bolts and do very cool stuff like that and now for the final two we have the manipulator who is uh, a telepath with a classical uh, old school power of telepathy which the roleplay is uh, pretty funny because they're they're basically like a, a comic book savant. Uh, once immersed in science fiction, they're now living it. But with, after they have been through psychic means, psychic connection, they've developed this telepath. So you're playing someone who is basically 
like most of us dream come true to have you know, to know all these uh, geeky powers and then have them and not only that but know that there are others like you out there so you're super excited about it mm -hmm. and uh, last but not least is a utilitarian who is a meta in uh, who is meta intelligent so uh, but also it's a uh, ex-operative that can be like a CIA operative or someone who is in a crime syndicate, an ex-assassin or something. Mm -hmm. They have like loads of skills and capabilities, but they also have their loved ones in their story tied with them. And they need to do everything to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the interesting bunch of characters that we have in store for this introductory session. Each of them unique, each of them offering their unique set of skills and capabilities. And uh, it's fun. It's, it has been fun seeing them come to life from various players uh, over this uh, few past months. Yeah, that's, that certainly makes sense. Now, with, the, with, that, set, with that said, when it comes to the, the module that, th that this introductory thing is going to be attached to, is it a module that is a one shot, or is it one that could be resolved over several um, sessions? With uh, with our module for this campaign, we are privileged to announce that we have made the uh, that we are now providers of premium content for uh, modules for Foundry Virtual Tabletop Platform, um, which is uh, which was a big thing for us to signing that deal because. It is the most convenient way to install and update the modules. So if you're using, if you're, uh, if you're already using Foundry VTT and you have a license, you know how easy and seamless it is to just go download them and uh, upload them whenever the the developer is uh, updating them and have uh, for free, obviously, and have a constant flow of, of a game that's being updated and taken care of all the time. With that being said, we do have three modules to offer. This, uh, the, starting with the introductory module, uh, of course, you don't mind me saying all, all information about all three of them, right? Because you just asked me for the introductory. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's uh, cool. Okay. So with the introductory, um, everything that is included in the scene, in the physical form, has now been translated into an introductory module, which is... Uh, it is yes, it is based for a one shot, but that doesn't end doesn't prevent anyone who just takes this introductory module to expand on their characters and play them multiple times. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the progression system in the introductory module, so you won't be able to unlock new meta powers, for example. Uh, so you can, but you can elaborate on the story itself. You can play like a session zero with each of your players. Uh, you can uh, divide the the one shot into you know two shot happens lots of times especially if you have like limited uh, scheduling issues with your players mm -hmm. so th there are ways around it but generally it has been built for a for a for a one shot session and it includes uh these characters these beautiful characters that we talked about but also npcs journals for both the players and the narrator which has all the information that behind the screen uh, stuff of the narrator which is the gm of this game rollable tables macros and uh, the whole nine yards now with the core the, uh, the core module which is available in our digital bundle and above you get access early access to the core game which includes the 100 meta powers from level one to five, all the 500 stuff, and uh, many more possessions and uh, and uh, more characters and antagonists. But uh, most importantly, you can now customize and create new actors, which are characters in Mo in Foundry. So you can uh, actually develop them and have as many meta powers different as you want. You can create your own NPCs as a narrator. You can have multiple characters. You can progress them and enjoy this experience. And finalizing, last but not least, we have the homebrew, which uh, this module uh, offers all of the above, plus the ability to uh, customize 
and change and include rules of your own and content of your own. When I, we do believe that role-playing games, one of the golden rules for role-playing games is to be able to bend the rules and break them or reconstruct them and do whatever you want with them. And this is the module that offers you that. So if you want to take Lightning Bolt, for example, but say in my world, Lightning Bolt does psychic damage because it uh, fries the brain, you know? Mm -hmm. You can definitely go to the drop-down menu, click, click, and instead of elemental, now the damage is psychic. Or if you want to include a new meta power at uh, electrokinesis level two, or a new meta power altogether, you can most definitely do that with the homebrew uh, module. And this is it for the modules. I hope it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hope I answered it thoroughly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, with with that said, since you talk. Since one of the well, one of the rewards is early access to the website. I'm guessing that you guys are planning on a website that's meant to be kind of a kind of a um, unified index for the game, or or a reference, kind of like what um, kind of like the compendium in um, Roll Twenty mm -hmm. is. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, the the website is uh, has been active from 2019. And it is actually where we built most of our game uh, upon. Uh, and it is uh, what, what we had in mind was at least twofold its services should be. Uh, before, uh, what's it called? DD Beyond, we were using a lot of sites like uh, d20.org, which were like uh, cross link databases. It's had all the information for the game that we were playing, let's say Dungeon, the Dungeon Dragon 3.5, with all the prestige classes, and where you were clicking this feat, you see which other feats it unlocked, and uh, when you are scouting for prestige classes, you can have them all in one place. And this is exactly what we had in mind when we built it. So we do have an active site right now, which you can join at metanthropes.com, and uh, you can see how we have uh, cross-linked databases which can you can click for example psychic energy type and see which meta powers are psychic you can click on uh, uh, activation main action you can see all the main actions and do all, all the aspects of the of the database are cross-linked and work in this fashion and we have all the content there already for all the 500 meta powers play tested quite a lot most of them yet not yet finalized uh, because it is so much content, obviously. Uh, it's it's going to take a couple more years to fully balance it. And uh, a lot more play testers from all over the world, uh, hopefully, to get as much feedback as possible. Uh, but elaborating more on the website and what it does, it also provides a place to meet players uh, and uh, schedule and organize your sessions. We have uh, private clubs we call coalitions, which you can have your own forums, your own calendar, your own uh, blogs, and each play group can have their own stuff and they can be private. Or if you want to play like worldwide event, that's part of our expansive vision, you can have open coalitions and say, this is like a, a tournament. Let's have a, you know, like a arena tournament mm -hmm. and we can post uh, your character builds and uh, how many, uh, which one is, is if it's a PvP tournament or a PvE, you know, uh, or play like a, a, a massive saga, like a campaign with multiple groups that play in the same uh, consistent universe and have all the exploits um, uh, in the same like place to be looked and discussed and, and uh, interacted by multiple players. So this is the service that we right now offers, but we envision also in the future offering with a website. And uh, by accessing it by the end of uh, March, alongside with the early access of each modules, you gain also very early, like like uh, like a 10, 20 days after the campaign is over, you gain access to all those stuff in early access to see where the game will go and be able to influence it with your feedback as soon as possible. Yeah, I I can certainly get that. Now, with this introductory zine, what are you shooting for as far as the page count? 
Uh, okay, I have been very careful with that and talking with my uh, designer who is taking care of it um, quite a lot because uh, the truth is that I've never actually really, I was all these years I was developing something in digital, in the website, which we have no page limitations. And uh, I've, I've uh, run many prototypes. The text is already written. It just requires policing and uh, proofreading furthermore. And I'm gunning for something like 64 pages. But I cannot say with absolute certainty. It might be minus four, maybe plus four. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to avoid getting closer to 70 because my um, the, the printer said maybe don't get a little more than 70 with a stable bound um uh, staple bound uh, bounding that you have in mind binding so um it will also depend on how many new artworks we're going to have with the stretch goals and how we'll translate the already those, those that I have already into you know fit everything nicely uh, but it is a a comprehensive zine that includes all the rules the ten pre-made characters and the one shot story to play so the vision and all the tests that I have pretty, pretty, so far are going well is uh, in 64 pages to have all this compact and nice experience. But allow me the margin of uh, plus plus minus four pages, something like that. <laughs> yeah. The, the so. Now, with now further on to that, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but a broader estimate. Yeah, allow me to double check my own frequently asked questions to make sure <laughs> that uh, what I say is double checked. Uh, but we do have some plans of releases. So let's start with the thing that comes the earliest, which is, as, as I mentioned, by the end of March, People who have any digital rewards, such as uh, access to website or the modules, will gain early access to those things. So you will be able to play, albeit in a in an early raw form, uh, with your friends as soon as possible. That was part also of our vision. To since we have them for so many years, this content uh, there can all be always be so much policing and working upon it. But uh, we wanted to offer it as soon as possible to the players. And you know what? Especially with the modules, uh, which have been working for less than a year, we want our, our backers to give us their feedback before we fully release them and work on their ideas and inc incorporate their ideas and, and uh, feedback and make them better. And um, so about let me check the other things about the shipping and the other dates let's go back to the campaign let's go fulfillment and digital goods so as for the pdf the pdf files um and the finalized introductory module will be uh, finalized by july 2024 as for the core and homebrew modules which, which are vast when it comes to their content or their capabilities. We want to be realistic and give ourselves as much as buffering zone as possible. So it's going to be by December 2024, so basically by the end of this year. Now, as for the, um, as for the physical goods, we're planning printing to begin by July 2024. And... Uh, as for the shipping, we uh, will begin after, you know, the printing is done. Printing no longer takes than a couple of weeks max, but we, we, we can't promise with absolute certainty as first timers, and we want to be transparent at that, when it will lead your home. What we can promise is that, is that all parcels will have GPS tracking and will require a personalized bound delivery so you will know when your goods will arrive safe and sound to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, I want to mention also our services that we're providing with this campaign, which include sessions with uh, yours truly, myself, uh, and uh, technical uh, and premium, premier technical uh, service for the narrator support, 
which actually helps them to install the module and uh, and uh, any person that has any technical difficulties but want to play digital online, we also provide services for them, for all those who purchase our last two pledges, which is the session and the saga, which is like five sessions. Mm -hmm. And uh, those will begin, the, let's start with this, the, the, the premier narrator support service will start by May 2024. The, also, the one-shot sessions the introductory sessions with uh, myself will begin by May 2024 and conclude by July or up to the end of the summer. This is depending stro strongly on the scheduling of the players who, who, who purchase them, you know. So even between the group, because you, you, you play, uh, if you buy this pledge, you buy them and you get three of your friends to come too. Uh, you don't just play with yourself, obviously, or with other random strangers. You can... Um, Play with three of your friends. If you don't have any three friends, we can play with other people who, who, who have purchased this one and group them together. But all this is a, a part of scheduling. As for the saga, the saga is part of the core and the homebrew module, and you can play five sessions, not with the introductory characters, but create any character you want and mix all the meta powers you want. This one will take longer of time, and we want to uh, fulfill them as best as possible. So let's. We are sure about September. So after the one shots are complete, then we will begin with the uh, with the sagas. Mm -hmm. And I, I will keep an eye out for that. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that mm -hmm. happens here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and Thank you for having me. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>